Hello, everyone. Welcome to another exciting and um, what's the word that you would use for this one? Um, very, very jointed, not disjointed, very jointed installment of Club Moffat Talks. My name is Chris. I'm one of the instruction librarians on campus. I'm Joseph, and I am another instruction librarian here on campus. And I'm Ryan. I am the associate um, university librarian. Joining us today is Sebastian. Uh, you were um, asked by Tiffany Ziegler at the graduate program, I believe, if you'd come on and talk to us. So if you want to introduce yourself. Hey, uh, glad to finally meet you guys. Like we have been <laughs> scheduling these interviews since the summer. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I full name, Juan Sebastian. I just go by Sebastian because like Juan is like one of those Latin names that everybody's called Juan. You can go <laughs> to Colombia, say Juan, and everybody's going to turn around. Everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, I mean, I'm a graduate student here in MSU. I initially started here. I came here to a uh, master's in history, but I switched to the dark side of the business world. Oh. And now I'm doing an MBA. Yeah. <laughs> it, to the regret of Tiffany because she yeah she was the one who brought me for history, uh, but you know I mean I decided to do that switch because I work in marketing I've been working in marketing for three years, and I did my undergrad also here in the states and and in North Carolina. Um, before that I I've been living all over the place. I've been living here in the states for eight years, and I'm gone through Miami from there to Houston, then North Carolina, back to my home country in Colombia. And yes, I mean, academic wise, that's, you know, that's a pretty good like summary of who I am. I'm also part of the cycling team here. And those are pretty much all my passion, cycling, marketing. And yeah, I mean, at this point also, I still like love history, but even though I'm not doing that anymore. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, that's still a, a passion that you can have though. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's, it's very nice to, to kind of diversify your interests there. But, um, so you, you had your undergrad in North Carolina, mm -hmm. and you've had your entire graduate program uh, in Wichita Falls? Yeah, so far, yes. Okay, but you've lived quite a few places, though. Yeah, I know. Uh, it's been experience because, yeah, of course, my the first place that I went to was Miami. I was not, I was 17 back then, and then I pretty much, like, I came into my adult life here living in the States, so it's like that quite cultural, cultural contrast, like, you know, all my childhood back home, and then growing up as an adult here and, you know, having the exposure to those two worlds and, you know, living in such a big uh, metropolis with, you know, all those cultures like Houston, you know, Houston has like a lot of cultures and then Miami too. And then back in North Carolina, I also, you know, had the opportunity of meeting a lot of international students and here in Wichita Falls, I mean, middle of nowhere and in a little <laughs> town in Texas, but you find, nationalities from all over the place oh yeah it's very very yeah. very diverse here very wide variety of, of nationalities and, and backgrounds here I, I love that about this this campus it, it is very very inclusive in that regard um what was the way that i was going to word this um do you, do you feel comfortable here do you like it here hey, which is false yes i mean I... uh the states in general Oh, no, the United States. Yeah, I mean, it's I've come to I come to love this country in a special way because is uh, you know just coming from a small town in Colombia and you know growing up and you know I didn't have any exposure to like you know traveling around the world or anything and he, when I came here and you know just like the possibilities that it gave me um, because the first time I came here when I was seventeen um, my initial idea was like okay I want to do cycling and I want to study you know just to begin with that's something that I wouldn't be able to do back home back home when i uh, used to race there all of my friends uh, they were either gonna stop cycling to go and study or if they wanted to go professional that was a huge risk because uh, if you're professional at the national level it's not that fancy living you know you don't get that much money and then you don't have a chance of studying and then your career ends and you would realize that you are 20 something, 28, and you didn't start your college career yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, when I came here and I saw that I had that opportunity here, you know, that's, that's something that I feel blessed that I had. And it, it, it's just the people that I've met, the opportunities that I've had, all the mentors that I've met throughout the way. It's, it's been quite a trip, 
but I have like really good memories from all the places that I've lived in, all the people that I've met. And I think that's what makes this country so special that even though people feel that you are many times isolated, at the end of the day, you actually meet people, others who are willing to help you. And there are always opportunities and people who, if you know how to search for those opportunities, they're always going to hit people who will guide you. Yeah, I feel like that's a, a great strength of this this college and this organization too, is that people are very willing to reach out and help out and kind of make you feel at home. So I'm very glad to hear that that's the case for you though. So uh, usually in these podcasts that we have, we go around and kind of do like a round table kind of thing where we just talk about what we've been interested in lately. Like if you've been watching any movies or reading books, playing video games or whatever, we just kind of talk about that and, kind of catch up because um sometimes we don't get a chance to do that so much so if you'd like to go first or it, not, not to put you in the spot if you'd like for us to go first yeah, i mean you. yeah you you can go first and i see you know what you guys been into and i can comment if absolutely yeah. yeah yeah well there's something i want to talk about today um there's just something about that today today is the international world standard day which is a holiday which is recognized by most most countries as uh, basically trying to um, support um, international standards between mm -hmm. countries. Now, I say most countries because today is not inter International World Center Day in America. Uh -huh. That's next month, which is the most American international standard fact about the World International Standards Day, I could possibly find out. It's utterly ridiculous, and I love it. The fact yeah, that, like... that the entire world recognizes October 14th as International World Standards Day, except the United States, who recognized November 14th as International World Standards Day. There was this, yeah. I, I don't fantastic. watch SNL, but I have a friend who sent me these amazing SNL clips. Um, it was like the the founding fathers deciding on like the the u.s measuring system they're like oh yes we'll we'll have um uh 12 inches and a feet and of course the the very memorable number 5280 feet in a mile and everyone's just like why 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 not have it um normalized they're like that's just because that's the american way um that's been living in my head rent free for a few weeks now uh, well, I will say foot is specifically the length of a person's foot. So you can mark course, out. It makes so much sense. You can mark out how many feet something is just by walking. And a mile is how far a leech could walk in one day. In one, in, I'm sorry, in one hour. Huh. And I met some people with really small feet. I don't know. Yeah, I know. It's, that, it's that would be easy. mess yeah. up the <laughs> measurement. Or, or really <laughs> short people, you know, like. <laughs> Like um, how how fast can they walk? You know, like uh, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, today is Columbus Day as of, as of the time of our recording. So, uh, 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 uh. Indigenous In Peoples Day. It's been Indigenous Peoples Day. There, there we go. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I knew that there was a um, there was a preferred um holiday for today, and I couldn't remember which one it was. But yeah, uh, Columbus Day is now Indigenous Peoples Day. Is that official or is that just uh? I think on the national level, it's official. Of course, um, uh, there are a, a number of organizations and people and, and ethnic groups that still celebrate Columbus Day. So, yeah. and sure. someone from Colombia probably celebrates Columbus Day. Who knows? I was actually double checking because I wanted to fact check something <laughs> that I was gonna say. I, I, I that's like some bad habit from history. Oh no, and, that's a bad habit for librarians <laughs> too. All of us do that. So, but uh, actually, I what we celebrate is the Day of the Race and Dia de la Raza, and that was last Saturday, oh. October the 12th, okay. and, you know, it's also, like, tied to the discovery of America, but uh, the, what we celebrate during that day, yeah, it's, like, the discovery of America, you know, we always have, like, those civic acts in schools where we just, like, everybody's, like, dressing up and doing, like, the plays of, like, how Columbus arrived, uh, but we gave a special meaning because... Uh, Fun history file. Chris, if you're going to be up and about, would you move those microwave those microphones that are near nearer the screen? Oh yeah. Sorry, not to not to 
yeah like actually yeah more 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 left and right than that or oh, yeah the edge of the table. Uh, oh yeah <laughs> more 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 left and right than that you can't that's into the table if they go more a little bit okay that's fine off. yeah that's they're fine. falling off that's that that is actually better that's that's less obstructive oh yeah i know i was gonna tell you that you know the phone history facts that you know back in the early 20th century when you know latin america went through its uh kind of like a uh, wave of nationalism mm -hmm. uh we as we, cre we created this day of Dia de la Raza, you know, as, as a way of uh, Latin American countries of feeling that pride of like, oh, yeah, we are not European white. Uh, we are not indigenous. We are a mix. But that makes us actually special. That not makes us less. And that's pretty much what we still celebrate during that day. Like, and they always give you a narrative of like, oh, we are the children of the three continents of Africa, America, and Europe. And that makes us special in a way that we have the blood and the best qualities of the three races. And that's pretty much what we celebrate. Yeah, so it's like, um, so it's like saying that um, Latin American is like its own version of its own like cultural pride there. It's not, it's, it's not um tied to any one race it's its own thing like a monolithic thing kind of yeah and even like they in in some people have called like the cosmic race oh yeah that's how they call it like because we are a mixture and that's pretty much what we celebrate during your version of like columbus day sure yeah. <laughs> interesting and when you said race i was like like, like a <laughs> like a like sports race but no you mean like a like yeah <laughs> okay. well there we go um <laughs> It's just immediately I'm thinking like, well, yeah, no, no, but... <laughs> no. Uh, anything else, Ryan? Um, I wish I could sleep more. I've been having insomnia lately. Other than that. I'm... <laughs> sure. Sure. That makes sense. Uh, Joe. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I've been watching things, reading things. Uh, last month on the podcast, I had a little rant about the fact that I own a copy of Stephen King's book on writing, but had never read it. So since the time of our last podcast, I have now read that book. Oh. I still stand by what I said about that I don't care what he says in it about writing. Um, there's actually one thing that he says in it that I was all like, I appreciate that. Thank you for that which was, you don't need to read this book. I was like, thanks, Steve. I appreciate that. <laughs> Validated. Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, in addition to that, uh, I've been doing the nightly reading with uh, my wife. We're do reading the uh, uh, Wheel of Time books, and um, I've been watching stuff on TV. I watched the new season of Rings of Power, I've been watching the new season of uh, Only Murders in the Building, which I believe actually ends tonight. Yeah. Um, I've been watching the Agatha All Along, which I really enjoy. Um, yeah, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, and I've also, I have found a, a, a streaming service that's uh, free called Tubi. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And it has a lot of old movies and old TV shows on it. So uh, I've been watching old Westerns, uh, pretty specifically like old, what they call spaghetti Westerns. A lot of uh, the ones that were like filmed in uh, Italy, sometimes by Italian actors. I've been watching the Trinity ones and... Uh, and some old TV shows, they have a lot of the old Doctor Whos, and I've been watching those, like the actual uh, first Doctor, William Hartnell. And they also have uh, the original TV version of La Femme Nikita with uh, Pet Wilson. Uh, so I've been watching some some stuff like that and, and enjoying all of that. Is Tubi the one, or is, is it Tubi or Pluto that has the Godzilla channel? Uh, I believe it's Pluto. That might be Pluto. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think it's Pluto, and it's that's one of those things where I have watched some Godzilla movies, but it's not a passion for me like it is for you. So it's, that's not something that I would have uh, 
that would would have triggered my memory. Do you have a favorite Godzilla movie? Honestly, I've never been a Godzilla fan. Oh, okay. I mean, I right. watched one of the recent ones, but yeah. I'm not a fan. I was like, oh, I'm going to watch it. I mean, it's yeah. a different. Those are, yeah, the the new, I like the new ones a lot. Um, if, 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 if I had to answer that, I'd say uh, an 84 Godzilla, the revival um, Godzilla mm-hmm. movie. But minus one was utterly fantastic. I said that on the, you didn't like the revival, Ryan? Are you talking about the actual American version or the Japanese no, version? No, God, no. I'm talking about the, um, it's a reboot. In, okay. from, it's the Japanese uh, line of Godzilla. I think it's the first the one. Second, the second, I forget, they name them after emperors. Um, um, it's the second, second Heisei, emperor. The Heisei era. Okay. Yeah. When you said 84, you remind me of Godzilla 84, which was an American production run by Pepsi, which oh, was terrible. Yeah. No, no, I'm talking about Godzilla 98, my favorite movie ever. Okay. That's not a good movie at all. No. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, Tubi is uh is is really great. I'm seeing a lot of ads for that. And in fact, I'm seeing a lot of like a lot of instances where I'm like, where in the world is this one show that I want to watch? And it's like it's on Tubi and that's it. Yeah. So that's a that's a, a really good one. Well, and there's there's still some uh shows that I've I've been feeling nostalgic for as their anniversaries approach or you know whatever uh that I just cannot find anywhere and it makes me sad uh like Ryan you you will probably remember the TV series version of Buck Rogers mm-hmm. that's not available anywhere um mm. or or the British series uh Blake's 7 you can't watch that anywhere. It doesn't. It doesn't exist. I think I read somewhere. I'm that actually they trying to like learn from here. Yeah. Just recently released Blake Seven. I think they finally got the rights to it. I think I saw a news thing last week about it. Really? Okay. Well, I will have to track it down. Uh, there's a a character in the Blake's Seven that is my favorite character in that series and is one of my favorite characters ever. Uh, He's one of those characters that's not a good guy. He's uh, morally questionable uh, and is just by far the most interesting character. Uh, There's a a whole thing where uh, he's, he's the conniving Weasley manipulator guy. Uh, and he always manages to extract himself from trouble. And there's a a, a thief uh, character that is uh, part of the crew, and uh, they uh, they do a thing where uh, uh, the thief goes with the manipulator guy on his on a mission. Because the thief is all like, I know that I will be safe with you. No bad thing will happen to me if I go with you. So they go off to a planet. It's a, it's a science fiction thing. There's spaceships and all that. They go off to this planet and they're leaving t- to come back. And the ship that they're on has been sabotaged uh, in a way that has that the ship has uh has had weight added to it. And it's not a lot of weight, but an amount of weight has been added to it that's going to prevent it from being able to break orbit the way that it's supposed to. So the conniving guy is all like, what what weighs that amount? And the ship's computer responds to him. It says, actually, the thief weighs that amount. And so the guy's all like, Well, all right, then I know what I need to do. And the thief overhears it and starts hiding from him because he knows he's about to get ejected from the ship. Um, And then while he's looking for the thief to throw him off the ship, he finds the object that's been added to the ship and manages to drag it to an airlock and eject it. Uh, But the end of that episode is the thief, you know, trying to talk, being asked, uh, how how the mission went and the manipulator guys is like well you know you're always safe with me just so you know um joe yes um blake seven is streaming on amazon prime 
It's what? streaming on BritBox. It's also streaming for free on Sling TV. Okay, well, I have one of those. So I can I can watch it then. My toddler pronounces the word thief like beef because uh -huh. there's a little cartoon wolf in her toddler shows that she watches. There's a, there's like a there's like a thief, like a bandit wolf character mm -hmm. or something, and so she'll run around going, "It's the beef." She's talking about beef. I'm like, oh no, is the beef is the beef here? It's just, where's the beef? Where's what, the beef? What cartoons are toddlers watching at this? Oh my God, just These crap days. on YouTube that just oh, just see. whatever. But it's like. Okay, they teach things. They teach how to count and colors and whatever the alphabet. It's fine, I guess. It's just it, a lot of it I've noticed um, comes from like Korea. Like, there's like the uh, Baby Shark, the, the cartoon Baby. I'm pretty sure That's from Korea. that whole. I'm pretty sure that whole like there's a cinematic universe of, oh. of these cartoon characters, okay. and uh, they're not they're not high quality at all. But they do focus on like like storylines and like matching colors and all that stuff. So, um, and a lot of it, I have to wonder how much of it is poorly translated because they have their songs and they don't rhyme. They barely fit like enough syllables into their, their singing and like their lyrics and stuff. So it makes me wonder like, what does this sound like in the original language? Because it's like, it's so obviously like they're fitting in as much as they can and whoever it is translating and like coming up with the lyrics and everything is not a native speaker because yeah. it's like it's like nothing rhymes unless it's by accident. So it's just like fans translating these. No, it's their own. It's their own company. Oh. Like it's the people that work there in these animation studios, but they're doing the own their own translations. But if they you know they don't speak like actual English, then yeah, they're like it's it's so weird because it's. Like, okay, well, thank you for, you know, giving these things to my children for free. But now I have to, like, try to say, like, okay, well, you could have rhymed it like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like, I'm trying to then come around and say, like, okay, let's do a little extra teaching on the side because whatever. But, um, well, that that's a thing that happens sometimes in translation where uh, translating a paragraph, a sentence, a page word by word rather than thought or concept at a time. And that's a very different thing. Um, yeah, and and, and you'll see well, it in, I, I, in things that are even- I was gonna familiar. give you- Huh? I'm sorry, for, sorry for interrupting. I was gonna give you like a, a, a actual quote that a mentor of mine, because when I did my undergrad, I did like literature and in history. Uh, one of my mentors who was actually a poet uh, in Appalachia, he say, uh, what is lost in translation is poetry. Mm. Mm. And yes. it's the same thing. Like, if, you know, it doesn't matter if it's uh, an actual book or a program. You know, translation just many times kills that meaning that was initially intended. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that, too. I try, like, whenever, I, if I have to translate something, whatever, I try to, like, look at what, like, how are these words put together? Like, is there more intent in the word that was picked than there was, like, the words that were chosen? You see that a lot, too, in, in, like, any language. My favorite example of something translated was, um, I can't remember who did it, but there was a translation of um, Dante's comedy that, um, like, Italian to English is, like, hard enough as it is. But this person was able to do, like, the whole, like, three stanzas rhyming with, like, their particular... Um, uh, rhyme pattern. I can't remember what the word is, but like, oh, that's that's hard to do in English. It's extra, yeah, it's extraordinarily hard to do. But but he manages he managed to maintain it for all three books. Um, I'll I'll have to remember who translated that, but yeah, um, that's one of my one of my because that was one of the big things about the Divine Comedy is it is rhyming, but because oh, um yeah. most words end with a vowel in in Italian. It's rather easy to do sometimes in Italian to do that rhyming scheme. But yeah, that's one of my favorite, um, like literary, like like physical books that I own is. is and but Sebastian's like, what the heck are we all talking about? We're librarians. We talk about books. We talk about translation. We talk yeah. about uh, TV shows. We talk about these things. So so let me tell you about what I've been doing lately. Um, <laughs> nothing really. Um, <laughs> like I said, I have two kids, and they're literally all day until like. 
8 to 8.30 when they finally fall asleep. And then it's like I sit on the couch and I try to think about what I've done. And then my wife and I just like whatever. We've been we were watching um 90 Day Fiance. We were we were suffering through that for a while. Uh no, I mean she's she loves it and I just like watching stuff with her, so I'll just sit there and just watch it. But um they I think did I mention it in the last episode where like all the American individuals are like the worst human beings alive it makes me want to want to just i i don't terminate the human race watching him talk it's so disgusting yeah. i i don't remember you saying that last episode although stating that americans are the worst people i feel like as just a blanket statement yeah. is kind of a universal truth that's there, probably just I'm, okay to just put out there you know i'm thinking of a few people and they're like they, they make me sick that these people are allowed to be on tv and not in jail you know it's I like oh well, you get you get a national spotlight and not put in a six by six cell where you should probably live because you shouldn't be around other human beings i've mentioned it to you before chris if that's really what you feel about um reality tv show in the united states which i agree with it's it, reality tv shows tend to grab the absolute worst americans yeah the worst of know, people and stuff like that yeah. i'm letting you know it once again you should watch solitary because they take those people and they torture them which is yeah, just fantastic um, and you love it and they well, I, what i love about it is they don't torture them they make them torture themselves which i think is just hilarious I want to watch Love themselves After Lockup. Just that little bit of fame. Have you heard of that? No. What is it? It's, it's kind of like that, but it's like people who meet in jail, like people who like fall in love and like whatever. Like either they come out of jail and they're um, finding like romance after jail, or like the people that like make pen pals in jail that they like that fall in love with their pen pals or whatever. And it's yeah, that's all I know about it. I really I don't know where to find it, but I'm I'm interested in the concept of that. Apparently, it's like ninety days Beyonce, but but the the prisoners are are more likable than the normal people that they have on this other show. Um, but yeah, so I I haven't really been doing a whole lot. Um, I mentioned this to Ryan, but there's a there's an anime out right now that's based on a really classic manga series. I think. Joe, were you on? Were we talking about this when when uh, Peter Fields was in here? We mentioned uh, Junji Ito, the manga artist. Uh, possibly, but I I don't remember. Do you ever read any manga? Back when I used when I had like fourteen, I actually like anime oh, okay. a lot. Yeah. Did you have a favorite? Well, I mean, I honestly watched the entire Naruto series, like from the very first episode to the last one mm -hmm. of the. Uh, Shinobi one, and then um, besides that one, uh, I had just like these sporadic shows that I would like look at, but that one was definitely my favorite. Yeah, N never, never watched One Piece. Then I was not a One Piece fan. The the new the live action series is really good. They do I, have a live action series. Yeah, Netflix just started one. The second season's filming right now, but it's yeah, it's fantastic. It's a it like they do new things with the material, but it still feels like one piece. It's just not, you know, a thousand episodes long. It's like mm -hmm. an eight episode season perfectly covers like a pretty big chunk of what the manga was working on season two right now. I, I couldn't be happy with it. My wife has like almost no interest in anime and she watched this the whole season with me. Just totally invested in it. I need to look it up. Honestly. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, but uh, right now there is a there's a series coming out. It's only four episodes, um, based on like the most famous horror manga of all time called Uzumaki. Uh, it means spiral. It's about this town that is um, that Hurst. is um, taken over by the curse of spirals. It's just like spirals start appearing and everything and they like take over this town and it's it's completely terrifying and just really disgusting and like very kind of classical horror almost um so really short it's like two volumes long it's it's like one of the one of the shortest mangas ever i read it in a day right um so they announced this thing in 2019 and they're like yeah we got the rights to it the or adult swim Cartoon Network, we got the rights to it. We're going to start producing a mini series over it. And 
five years after the fact, everyone's like, it's four episodes. What, you know, like I could do this in, in four episodes and I don't know how to draw anything. I can barely draw like a human being. Right. Um, so they finally drop it and it's like, it's the most embarrassing thing I've ever seen in my entire life. You have off key characters, everything's CG. So like everything already looks sterile, but it's like in black and white to make it look like a comic book. But black and white and CG makes it look like just a blob of of no colors. And you'll have like, th there's a scene where a guy is like pulling his girlfriend along a beach, but they're like off kilter. Like, so they're like this, but they're running forward. Like it's, it's so baffling. And, and the director came out and said like, well, look, here's the thing. We had, we had problems with investments. The, the people on the board wouldn't, um, they wouldn't let the animation directors come in the room. Um, it was, they took over the entire project and then we ran out of money. So we thought we would either scrap the project or just release what we've got and let, you know, I think the exact word he said was just release it warts and all and let the people decide how it is. And it's terrible. It, it's so bad. It makes me like, it, it hurts my heart. To see, to see something like this that had a lot of love poured into it by its original creator. A lot of love poured in on its very first episode. It looks fantastic. It's, a, it's incredible. It's, it's, uh, it was a good show of, of what it was going to be like. And for it to be just betrayed by uh, corporate suits, uh, it hurts my heart. I wanted to talk about that a little bit because it was so, it was so disappointing to me. So... Um, Outside of my great disappointments and my um, um, holding on to sanity, raising children, that's all I've got. That's all I've got for today. So, um, if you wanted to talk about anything, if you could, if you could top that from us, then please feel free. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I wanted to touch on something they said about our, our Americans being so terrible, about, like how we glorify uh, like that type of like the worst of our culture in TV right now. And actually I had those conversations with same mentor that I just mentioned a few minutes ago uh, when I was in my undergrad. And we had these conversations back then in North Carolina, there was a little cafe tavern in the town and we would just go get a beer and just like talk. And he, he one time we were talking about like how we are in this type of counterculture era and history is cyclical. And we just always go into these like, up culture, counter culture, up culture, counter culture is eras. And right now we pretty much like we see it in everything, in in mass mass media and then in politics and everything. That everything is upside down. You yeah. the, the type of people that you see like this is not normal. This is not political. This is not a uh, culturally appropriate appropriate. Yeah, that's pretty much what we are uh, consuming and uh, you see that in in cycles and you know you think a hundred years ago the type of personalities that would be you know in the tv were or that were that people were glorifying were different like you know more people that represented better value than what we're glorifying right now in media yeah, but then, but then, uh, just a few years after that one, then you get their own counterculture. Yeah. What's What's kind of interesting to me though is how that it kind of blends. Like you said, it goes down, then up, but it's the way that it blends what's happening with the culture into how that counterculture is formed. Like right now, the counterculture is one that's. Um, I'm not I'm not being negative about this because I don't want to get into politics, but it's very nationalistic. It's a very like you see it all around the world, like in Europe and various uh, countries around the world and in South America and America, North America, rather like it's like nationalism is hugely on the rise. And like we're seeing people protesting against that nationalism. But it that comes from at least here in the United States, that a lot of that came from like the era of like 9-11, the ultra patriotism, where it was cool to be a patriot because like it kind of like joined everyone together and like you had this sense of civic pride because there was a big, uh, this big national tragedy. And then that became, well, let's keep going down. Let's keep going down that hill, you know, that slope. And it's a slippery slope basically. But um, yeah, it's, it's interesting because now like the culture that you see, like um, one of the, one of my favorite shows that I've talked about before is uh, not my favorite show period, but currently airing is the boys and the boys is like, heavily heavily 
uh, rejecting and critical of nationalism. Like that's its, its main theme, really. Um, nationalism is like kind of symbolized by these superheroes or whatever. But like the culture, culture, like art, literature, and stuff is a is largely rejecting of that side of nationalism, whereas like the actual national nationalism is continuing on to be on a rise it's it's such a it's a weird time to be alive it's, yeah. well chris again history major here and i'll talk a little about the history of it um yes. it, what we're seeing today with, with the rise of nationalism is a pushback against globalism which started in the 1990s and so you're seeing a lot of nations for instance uh the uk with brexit you're seeing a lot of uh the rise of 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 nationalist parties in all throughout Europe, all throughout the uh, Asia, all throughout uh, um, both North America and South America, um, national movements. Uh, Brazil, for example, um, uh, just went through a national swing. Um, but it, 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 it's a push against the back, back against globalism. And the idea that um, one of the things globalism does is it makes nations tend to specialize in certain industries and then neglect other industries. And so there's been a big pushback from people who said, well, can't we do everything ourselves? Can't we just can't we just be by ourselves and isolationist and and do everything ourselves? And that isolationism um, type thing, it, it's part of a cycle. It's part of a cycle that goes between globalism and nationalism that swings back and forth. And it's not much different than it was um, back in the 1930s, for example, when there was a big push because of uh, the uh, the Great Depression. Uh, to become isolationist, like the Americas did, and a bunch of other countries did as well, became very isolationist and became very, we're just going to take care of ourselves and let the other countries, you know, suffer how they suffer. But um, we need to take care of ourselves first. So it, it's a push and pull. It's a cyclical nature of things. And again, with the fall of the Soviet Union in the 1990s, we saw a huge push for globalism in the 1990s. And the nationalism rise to today which is not just the United States, but it's all sorts of countries across the world, I think is a big pushback against that from uh, 30 years ago. Yeah. But it's hard to be, like, it's hard to imagine an isolationist, like any kind of government or, or uh, culture right now when the internet exists. Like, uh, and, and of course you have places like North Korea and China where the internet is heavily monitored, but it still exists. Like it's still out there. Like people are still more connected now than they ever have been and probably ever will be for a very long time. I mean, but it's a double edged sword because, you know, it also, it, it, the internet, we have seen it in many cases, you know, here in America, you see how the internet is used to divide people even more. Yeah. Disinformation and fake yeah. news and all that stuff. Yeah. It's, it, it really just, that's one of the things that as librarians, we try to push back against and say, like, here's like, we've got to show people like it's our professional duty like here's how to identify reliable information and here's how to move away from fake news but that that um assumes that people actually listen to us you, you people on youtube right now <laughs> thank you for watching <laughs> um but before this before this conversation takes a dark turn we've had some episodes of this podcast where we just had to say like we're, we can't we have to start re-recording we just have to scrap <laughs> this entirely because we're we've we've gone off the deep end now. So before that happens, um, this this actually goes really um, really well into something that I had wanted to ask you before. Uh, yep. Being someone who's uh, who's heavily into cycling, um, Wichita Falls has its own cycling community. Like it's like the hotter than hell that one hundred just happened. Uh, uh, was every that, August, every yeah. August, yeah. So that was just two months ago, really. I wanted to ask. Um, I guess two questions, one being how does, how is Wichita Falls in your opinion as a cycling community? And the other one just being like, do you have a, do you have a favorite of all the places that you've lived? Do you have a place that you would consider your favorite that you've uh, been able to get into cycling with? Well, I mean, Wichita Falls I knew about since 2017 when I used to live in Houston because of hot and hell. Uh, I used to race back then with a little team based in Houston and we will come here every year. I did 2017, 2018, and then I moved to North Carolina. And what I have to say uh, that when I came here and I realized like after COVID, you know, how the cycling community 
dispersed a little bit and now it's trying to regroup. But back in the day, I remember 2017, first time I came here for Heart and Hell, the first event that was a race around the MPEC. Mm -hmm. And it was packed with people and you would see people coming out of the emporium and just like staying there, just watching the cyclist and you know, that, that, that was one of like those first experience of like having that much people watching my race. And I was like, wow, like this is, this is how it feels when you're a pro. Yeah. So like you were like the main character then. <laughs> yeah, no, and it was fun. And, and you felt the atmosphere. And, and right now, like it, Hotter and Hell is trying to like rebound again. And there has been some changes in the organization. Uh, but Wichita Falls, you know, compared to other places that I've been, it's pretty welcoming for cyclists. And um, yeah, you have the contract stuff. Houston, Houston is not welcoming for cyclists. It's not welcoming for a lot of people, honestly. <laughs> uh, uh, shout out to Houston. Yeah, no, I mean it's it, it, it which the falls honestly. It's a really welcoming community, not just for cyclists, for anybody. And I mean, I I would say like cycling paradise. I would never change North Carolina. Uh, you know, you have the mountains and oh sure, yeah, yeah and then you have the Blue Ridge Parkway and it was just a different experience. It, it, like just going through the parkway and seeing at the end like just the mountains all painted in blue, it with the mists and it's it's just something that you cannot compare, of course. But but over there it was it was it was uh, really nice experience to cycle when you could cycle because it was like covering the snow oh. uh, yeah five months out of the year so you have to really like focus on it like okay i have to go cycle now <laughs> yeah <laughs> basically yeah that's that's incredible though i'm glad that you enjoy it here that much though, with yeah you know. so is there a cycling team on campus yes we actually do have a cycling team and we actually won one nationals last year and this year we also got a title in nationals wow and uh, we have a growing team now. The school is investing more money in it. So we have been expanding the number of riders that we have. Uh, and even though the team is smaller than some programs in other parts of the country, we've been pretty competitive. Like again, we have had multiple national titles throughout the history of the team. And now we have been getting more support, support to go to more races. Um, our coach Paulo Cruz, he has been really into trying to expand the program, and uh, now we are actually like getting into uh, you know uh, big races and being able to compete with some of the big schools uh, and and getting the support that you need to be able to do that. Yeah, but yeah, it seems like the the most important thing there is just being able to do it. Yeah. like being able to compete there that's that's like seems simple but like of course like if yeah you're there you're you're participating that's a, a huge deal oh, yeah, it yeah. Is. um so aside from that though i wanted to ask you about um just being in the grad um community what is it that you do i was wondering i don't think we talked about that at all before we started talking in our podcast here so, uh, well, I mean, when I, you mean about my graduate assistant position? Yeah. yeah so what I do for the school is that I do content and uh, uh, so I manage like the social media of the graduate school and also like con promotional content for different graduate schools. Uh, recently, I've been working with the exercise physiology department, with the radiology department, uh, with medical uh, health administration department. Um, and because I, that's pretty much what I have been doing since I started working in marketing, online marketing, uh, I'm trying to like, uh, you know, apply those things that I know and, you know, help those departments promote themselves a little bit better. Uh, now, you know, that one of the things about social media is uh, it, you know, it's for anybody it's super easy to, you know, have a voice and, you know, it, it's only a matter of like knowing how to present yourself and knowing how to give the message in a really concise way that people will consume it easily. And that's pretty much what I'm trying to bring to the, into the department. And that's the reason why they have me there. Oh yeah. And obviously the, you're, you come very highly recommended for your skills because that's what we're here talking, right? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so 
I guess I just uh, just as a follow up to that one, I was wondering what does the the graduate program do like to facilitate learning and and so as a whole the department what we do is helping students who are trying to apply to any graduate program um, and besides that we also kind of like coordinate activities for graduate students uh, student involvement and also you know of course uh, Dr. Siegler and Emma who works at the department their job is also like ensuring that students are having the best experience and ensuring that programs are delivering the value that they promise to students. So they are always on top of everything and knowing, you know, checking that students are uh, learning what they, you know, expect to learn, that they are having the experience that they were expecting when they came here and that it's even better than what they were expecting. Um, and also like smooth, smoothing that the application process. Hmm. Okay. Well, that sounds like a, I mean, it sounds like a really great place to have on our campus then. Yeah, yeah. No, and honestly, like any resource that any graduate student may be looking for, you know, that's the place to go. Anything related to scholarship opportunities or um, uh, applying to programs or, you know, academic advising, you know, that's the department takes care of that. So you'd recommend that to just anyone listening, really, is just to reach out, just to just to talk to someone there if they yeah. were interested. And even in undergrads who want to do a master's, current graduate students who may be having any difficulties, that's a place where, you know, you will always find some help. Yeah. Um, fellas, you've both been unusually quiet today. Well, Did I'm you just have anything you'd like to mountains. add or talk about? I'm just admiring the Blue Ridge Mountains, as you can yeah, see. There they yeah. are. Yeah. It's, he's there. Did you know that? Yeah. He's calling us from, uh, he's wasting his time in the mountains to talk to us. Yeah. <laughs> I, no, I, you mentioned I, the Blue Ridge Mountains. I've seen them before, and they are absolutely gorgeous. I just wanted to pull up a picture of them. Yeah, no, that, that place is, it's unique, honestly. I, I've never been, I've never been to the Blue Ridge Mountains, but um, just the, the last time I went to Colorado was for a, kind of it was a for a pretty somber event but like there's this there's this thing when driving in from boulder to i think it's boulder to denver mm -hmm. i think going going up north and the way that denver is kind of like kind of isolated in the way that it looks like if you approach it from from afar but then from there to see like the the view of the rockies in the back there it's just it's just beautiful. It's like this. The, it's it's like seeing a, a an image from another world almost. The way it's just like snow capped, and then just a bunch of like dirt and, and whatever else around in in the area. It was it was like late summer when I went there, but still like all all year round, just the way that those mountains are just like glistening in the sun. It's just. And I think, like it, you know, from a philosophical stance, it, you know, just looking at the mountains just makes you realize how small we are yeah uh, and how much impact we have too yeah. like i mean it's like the lord of the rings thing like a little of uh, someone's something someone or something small can make a big yeah impact. but still seriously it's 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 humbling yeah it is really. humbling like even though it's inorganic it's just a mountain it's been there for millions millions of years yeah yeah uh, coming from where i'm from it's also like in the mountains of colombia so you know even back home Oh, if yeah. I had any a stressful day, just like go up and overlook and just look at the entire city from above. And I was like, wow, you know, I, down there, my problems were so big. But now I see them from here. And it's like, I you can't you can't see it. like it's, it's you cannot see them. Expect. Yeah, um, that makes me really envious, actually. I really wish there was something like that here. But yeah, I mean, you can go to Witch Mountain and <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um. Joe, I think you had something to say. I, yeah, I I had a question. Um, having lived in other places, like in North Carolina, uh, you still have a little bit of a, of a an emotional attachment to those places. And I was, and I'm just assuming that that is true. And if that is true, I was wondering what your thoughts were about like the recent hurricanes that we've had, because hurricanes coming to places where maybe you lived or where you have ridden your bike and you're like, oh, wow, I've been to that place. And now this thing is happening there. If you well, had any absolutely. thoughts about that. 
No, that actually impacted me a lot because I still have my friends there, the mm -hmm. cycling coach, the my mentors, professors, some friends who, uh, with whom I studied that still live over there. And, you know, I was looking at the pictures and their videos and many of the highways where I used to train and mm -hmm. the highways disappeared. They were not there anymore. The the bridges were collapsed. Uh, the school, thankfully, like uh, did pretty well. Didn't have any major structural damage. Um, but it's it's incredible that you know that 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 the hurricane reached that high in the mountains, mm -hmm. and it was not the first time that it happened because they you know I be I learned the history of the place too, and they had experiences with hurricanes before. But you know what happened this time was uh, outrageous, like that. Not nothing compared to history. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but then the community there, I assume, since it's such a a big community with that, that they're they really focus on getting everything repaired and getting mm -hmm. stuff set up. They have a, a, tons of reasons why they would want to get that fixed up in a hurry. Yeah. No. And even the small town where I used to go to college, it's called Banner Elk. And it's a small ski resort, and you know the community was super united. And um, even back then, the, uh, I used to work at a local restaurant. Everybody knew my name, and everybody would ask for me. And you know, I I saw the same people now. You know, helping each other. Even the cycling coach, who is still the same cycling coach, he took the the truck of the team. Uh, he has a big uh, fourth truck, and then just like was with the national guard, you know, picking up uh, supplies for for people. And he was going into like the places that where the roads were destroyed or where the bridges collapsed, and then just taking uh, aid to whoever was uh, you know affected by this. That shows a really high moral character too to to do something like that just just to help. Oh yeah, no. He he's like that type of guy. He was super serious. He would not be a guy that you would be joking around with, but he had a huge heart. He would be a guy, the kind of guy who would always be in the line helping people. It's always lucky to know someone like that. Yes. Uh, so not to rush you out of here, but we're uh, coming up on an hour on the hour, and okay. we we usually talk for about an hour, and we want to make sure that um, you've been able to say everything that you wanted to say. Oh, yeah. If there's anything else that you wanted to talk about before we kind of start wrapping up? Oh no, uh, you know you lead me. I mean, it's been a really good, nice conversation. Wonderful. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. Um, here at the end, uh, this is when I turn over to Joe, who has some things to talk about what's going on in our community. I didn't mean to, like, I sounded disappointed there. Like, it, it, I don't know if it picked up on the mic, but it, like, it made it sound like I was slapping my knee in frustration. But no, that's just what I, I'm just animated sometimes. It's okay. Uh, should we mention that you are, in fact, broadcasting from Mustang Studio yet again? We are broadcasting today from our wonderful, brand new, incredibly nice Mustang Studio here, available in the Moffitt Library, which you, listener, if you are a student faculty or staff can request to use, all you have to do is come in, uh, get a quick uh, course on how to use the equipment here, and you too can produce a podcast that's probably going to be a lot more professional than one that I could put on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I should I should have should have had a more encouraging more positive response to that but 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 yeah okay that's, um, as, that's as encouraging as I could be right now I'm sorry not, no you 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 did great and 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 you handed me the baton and I dropped it you know it's a whole thing um, okay but uh, elsewhere around our community and speaking of community uh, our community theaters are quite busy this month. Uh, you can watch Clue the Musical at Stage 2 Dinner Theater. And uh, Backdoor Theater is doing the play Fun Home. Uh, based on the graphic novel. Yes. Did you mention that last time? I, I know we've talked about it before, but did you mention that in our, our last podcast? I might have. I might have. I don't remember. I don't know how time works. Maybe. I don't know <laughs> what happened last last month. Um, the Wichita Falls Museum of Art at MSU Texas is hosting a print rally and art market uh, on this Saturday, October 19th, uh, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. 
Uh, you can bring your own blank t-shirt or tote bag and have it printed with the design of your choice for ten dollars. Uh, there'll be live steamroller printing, uh, MSU Texas art vendor booths, uh, food trucks, art activities, and more. The fall 2024 Eureka Scholars will present ongoing research in an informal poster session from 4 to 5.45 p.m. on Tuesday, October 22nd uh, in the Clark Student Center Atrium. Uh, also on that Tuesday, uh, the 22nd, the Department of Music will present the Red River Valley Choral Festival concert at 5.30 in Aiken Auditorium. Um, let's see. Uh, on October 24th, starting at 6.30, you can come out for trunk or treat at the parking lot across from the Coliseum. Closing out the month. For that. We, huh? we did that last year, and I'm just, I would just say get here early if you want to do that. Yeah. Um, well, and uh, the organizations that are participating, uh, student organizations and places on campus, I think are setting up as early as 4 or 4.30 so that they're ready to go by 6, and then the event is starting at 6.30. Uh, but I can imagine that that's a thing that is busier at the beginning. Um, closing out the month here at the library, uh, Rooftop Heroes, our pop culture mini convention celebrating fictional heroes in all their forms, returning for its second year at Moffat Library on Thursday, October 31st. Uh, we'll have speakers and presentations all afternoon, and we'll close out the event with a costume contest. We'll have a vendor area with student uh, outreach and uh, fundraisers, uh, including the MSU Texas uh, Esports and Gaming. You can check out an evening of improv at Backdoor Theater on November 2nd. Uh, don't forget to vote at the beginning of November. It's never been any more important than it is now. And Moffat Library will be celebrating Children's Book Week with daily readings uh, at four o'clock on Monday, November 4th through Sunday, November 10th. Uh, I'd, if you'd like to have more information about the things that I did mention today, and if you'd like to learn about all of the many activities and things going on on campus and in our community that I did not talk about, uh, please check out the events section of the MSU Texas homepage and the calendar at discoveredwichitafalls.com slash events. Um, yeah. Joe, whenever you mentioned uh, Rooftop Heroes, did you mention Tabletop Terrors? I did not mention Tabletop Terrors. Chris, the, tell us uh, about Tabletop Terrors. Yes, the MSU uh, Esports and Gaming Club is going to be hosting their uh, annual uh, board game night, uh, general uh, gaming night, uh, Tabletop Terrors. This is our fourth, I believe, year of putting this together. We're very excited to be able to um, to have them in here and uh, setting up if you're interested in that. I believe it should be on October 30th this year, so it's going to be the night before Halloween, which also means this is the first year that we're going to have it while the building is still open. So we're really excited to see how that's actually going to play out this time. It's going to be very interesting. So if you're interested in that, please come on by. Okay. And also, Sebastian, um, I wanted to thank you for coming in, talking with us. Uh, I guess I just wanted to ask, I don't know how to word this. Um, what are you training for now, now that the Hotter and Hell's done with? I mean, off season is coming up. Uh, right now, I'm just doing the, I'm not a mountain biker, but right now we're in mountain bike season. And the coach was like, hey, hey we need some people to do like the lower category races. It's like, okay, I'm not a mountain biker. I kind of like, you know, I crash pretty often oh. <laughs> but i can do it i can try um uh, and yeah it's just for fun uh, it's a way also like to uh, switch a little bit the routine because like you know sometimes you hyper focus on road 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 everything's road cycling up and now it's yeah. just like you know you can go in the trees just have fun uh, try a new skill yeah and then you yeah you have that you have a new skill whenever you're ready for your your main season, yeah. Oh yes, of course, and that's gonna be in the spring. And uh, we're gonna have our home race anywhere around April, and then nationals are gonna be in May, and that's gonna be my last dance because uh, I will be graduating after that. So congratulations! 
I, I hope it goes well for you. Oh no, I appreciate it. No, I, I'm going for it. I say that. I say that. And I ended up sounding menacing. I'm sorry, but really, I, I uh, best of luck to you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I think from Moffat Library, that'll do it for us. Thank you, everyone, for listening, and thank you again, Sebastian, for joining us. And that'll do it for us. Thank you all very much for listening. We'll see you on the next one.